It was an upscale bar. I probably should have called it a cocktail lounge, but it was a friendly place. When I struck up a casual conversation in the restroom with a guy who came in with some co-workers, he invited me to join their company, great company. Four guys and a couple of gals who had just left the office on a Friday afternoon. From what they said, it was their usual routine for Friday after work. The girls and three of the guys were married, the guy who invited me was divorced. From what he said, I gathered that he would linger longer than his work colleagues. They gave me a warm welcome, and we had a great time until the married ones got up to leave, leaving Phil and me. I told him I was in town on business and wouldn't be home until tomorrow afternoon. That's what I told him, and in a way, it was true. I needed to unwind after Monday night's event, and I was quietly celebrating. My wife picked up the kids yesterday morning and went on a long-awaited trip to her parents. The kids were thrilled, although they wondered why I didn't go with them this time. They will be back home on Monday. After all that has happened, it will seem strange to some that Alice and I don't spend the weekend cuddled up together. On Tuesday, we spent the whole day snuggling, sniffling, and snuggling, and for the rest of the week, we just hung on each other, except for my meetings with the other members of the future support group. We decided we needed a day or two to just think and get our heads together. Yeah, I did a little whining too, and if you think that makes me less of a man, go to hell. I'll be glad if something comes of it too. On the other hand, I decided that I needed to celebrate in silence, and the only safe way was to get away from the small town I was living in to some big place where I could blow off some steam. Don't get me wrong, no women for this daddy, but I needed to blow off some steam, just as they say, to look on the bright side of things. Phil told me he wasn't going to head to his apartment until after dinner and suggested I join him. It sounded like a good deal. We ate at a restaurant adjacent to the living room we were in, and he was very nice. Then he took me to a small jazz club, where we had a few more drinks, and apparently, I got too mellow. It was okay, he didn't know me and had no idea where I was from. Hey, Phil, I'm celebrating today, I told him. If you'll listen to my story, I'll pay the bill at the club. God, sometimes I wish I could keep my mouth shut. That little thing cost me a couple hundred. Next time before I open my mouth, I'll see how much they charge for drinks and cover. He threw me a perplexed look and nodded in agreement. Is that a single malt or four roses? He asked. Well, order the scotch if that's what you want to drink, I told him. It's a pretty good story, and it's coming to an end, but it looks like it's going to have a happy ending. Judge for yourself. With those words, I proceeded to tell the story. It all started a few weeks ago on a Tuesday at breakfast. I noticed that Alice had become very gaunt. She moved stiffly and acted like she was in pain. I asked her what was wrong. She replied that she must have slept badly and she would be fine. I continued working without thinking about anything else until I called her at lunchtime to see how she was feeling. She answered the phone angrily, something along the lines of, what do you need now? She stopped me for a moment, and when I said hi, she shrieked in surprise and stumbled over to apologize. She explained that she thought I was a telemarketer. She told me it was okay and that she liked me. She was much more affectionate than usual. As I hung up the phone, I wondered. She had been out with the girls on Monday. They had gathered for cards and wouldn't be home until late. They were real players, some of them played tournament bridge, and those games meant a lot to them. That morning, she walked until almost 2 o'clock, much later than usual, even for a bridge night. After thinking about it some more, I remembered that the same thing had happened the week before. It was then that I realized that she hadn't been listening to me talk about last night's game that morning. I usually listen with one ear, the same ear she used when I talked about my golf game, but I was still curious because I was interested in her and she hadn't said a word about it this morning. That's very unusual, and last Tuesday she woke up grumpy and moving around like she was in pain. I wrote it off as a coincidence and went back to work. That night I waited for her to tell me about the tricks she'd come up with, the silly bets her partner had made, who she was paired with, and so on. She didn't utter a word. I asked her how the game went, and she just said, it was pretty good, as usual. It wasn't normal at all. 
On the way home Wednesday, I stopped to pick up some groceries that Alice had asked me to pick up at the market. I ran into Faye, a casual acquaintance of mine but one of Alice's favorite Monday partners. I was entering the store, and she was coming out. We hardly slowed down as we passed each other. She said, hi, tell Alice I missed her on Monday, and I hope she can make it next week. I managed to take a couple of steps into the store before her words reached me, and when I turned around, she was already sitting in her car. That got me thinking. Something was going on, and it didn't seem to be good. We've been married for a dozen years, and in all that time, I'd never once doubted her. Suddenly, I was seriously worried about my marriage and my family. This wasn't like my Alice at all. The sudden doubts made me feel like I was in a fog too. All I had was a couple of coincidences and a random comment. Maybe it was Faye who had gone missing on Monday. Nevertheless, I decided I'd better figure it out. If I don't, it's going to bug me, and I'm going to be jealous and doubt my best friend. I had never been jealous before, and it would put a sour odor on our relationship. At the same time, I couldn't bring myself to tell my beloved that I doubted her. It was too ridiculous to be true, and she would either get angry or find it hilarious, or both. I didn't want to give her something to think about, and that's exactly what I'm going to start thinking about if I don't clear the air. I'm not too impressive looking, and I wondered how I would act if I found out my Alice was having an affair. Of course, it wouldn't make sense for me to get up to my full height, 5 feet 7 inches and 180 pounds, bald head and all. It would make me giggle, and I'd be the one going up. So that's something to think about too. If anything was happening, it was on Monday evenings when I was watching the kids, and she was supposed to be at bridge. I did a lot of thinking and planning that weekend. By Monday morning, I decided I had envisioned every possible scenario. That Monday, I called Alice and told her I had a lot of work to do. She said she would call our regular babysitter so I wouldn't be disturbed. The babysitter was supposed to arrive just before Alice left, which would allow me to suddenly remember that I needed to pick something up from the office, and the kids would still be looked after. I left about 45 minutes before Alice usually left. I just drove to the mall, where I parked my rental car. She had to drive past the mall on her way out of our little community, so I just waited for Alice to drive by in her Volvo station wagon. When she drove by, I pulled in a safe distance behind her. Almost immediately, I realized that she wasn't going to play bridge. They were supposed to play tonight just a half mile from the mall. Instead, she drove out of our little community, and I followed her to a small house in a questionable neighborhood just over seven miles away. She parked in the driveway, and after sitting in the car for a while, she got out and walked to a side door that I could see from my seat. She stopped on the porch, buried her face in her hands for a moment, squared her shoulders, opened the door, and walked in. From where I was sitting, I could see the window, and I watched my wife's shadow as she stopped in front of the window. The shadow was draped, but where she stood, the light was behind her. As I watched her shadow, it looked like she was taking off her clothes. When she turned off the light, I figured she was going either into the living room or the bedroom, but it didn't make much difference. An attractive, naked woman is a useful piece of jewelry wherever she goes. Emotions I hadn't realized I had came over me with renewed vigor. For a moment, I was sure I was going to throw up my lunch but managed to restrain myself. I had already turned off the overhead lights in the car, so when I opened the door, nothing caught my eye. I made sure I had all my accoutrements strapped into my fanny pack. That kit included brass knuckles, a bottle of muscle relaxant I'd managed to get my hands on, pepper spray, and a couple of other things I thought could probably come in handy. I headed for the side door. It was still unlocked and opened into the utility room next to the kitchen. The dark clothes I was wearing practically hid me from view, and the soft-soled shoes made no sound as I stepped onto the porch and opened the door. As I stepped inside, I heard a deep male voice say, Hey, where the hell is my day go? Go to the kitchen and fetch it. I saw a bottle of red wine standing on the counter, already open. I sprinted over to it, uncorking the muscle relaxant as I went, and poured some. I hoped it would be enough, but I didn't care if it was too much, not right now. Silently walking back to the back room, 
I waited until the door to the kitchen was almost closed. It turned out I didn't need to hurry. I was already in the pantry when I heard my wife whimper, then cry out in pain again after a thump that sounded like someone had fallen to the floor. I heard her wheezing her way into the kitchen. Wipe your face. I don't like snotty ones. Clean yourself up, and when you get back here, you won't be dealing with that husband today, came a male voice. My naked Alice walked into the kitchen, turning on the light. She was rubbing her breasts, on which a large red spot stood out as if someone had hit her. Taking the wine, she looked at the cabinets for a moment, opened one, closed it, then opened another and took out two glasses. Stepping out of the kitchen, she turned off the light. This was moderately good news, she hadn't been here often enough to know where things were kept in the kitchen. I knew my Alice. If she were here regularly, she would be very familiar with the layout of the kitchen. She seemed to study it whenever she visited an unfamiliar house, and I knew she didn't like pain. I'd bet good money she wasn't here of her own free will, and everyone knows I never bet less than a sure thing. Now all we had to do was wait for the relaxant to kick in, and that's not going to be easy, just sitting around waiting. Let me explain what a muscle relaxant is. In some medical procedures, doctors need the patient to be completely relaxed, and they have several drugs that do that. It doesn't mean the person can't use their muscles, but those muscles will be as weak as a kitten's. Don't ask me how I got it, I won't tell you. Sitting there was a living hell. I could hear the goon berating Alice and giving a few spankings. This guy loved pain, loved to inflict it, not take it, I was sure of it. But the hardest part was listening to the muffled sounds of him doing things to Alice and ordering her to do things to him. Finally, I stood up and headed out of the kitchen toward the voice. The waiting was not helping my mood, and everything I looked at seemed to have a red tinge to it. As I reached the end of the hallway and the half-open door, I heard Alice whimpering and whispering. I cursed silently, pulling on the gloves I had brought with me just in case. Please, please, please let me go. I haven't done anything to you. Please, I have a family, don't do this. God, I'm going crazy with this. There was the sound of another slap, then the voice, shut up. You're on your knees right now for a very good reason. I have no reason to be a good guy if you don't do your part, now get started. I looked into the room, and there was my wife, kneeling in front of this huge monster of a man. Heck, he must have weighed maybe 300 pounds, ugly as sin with a face riddled with scars. His underpants and shorts were down to his ankles, and he was pouring wine into a glass he held in his hand. The bottle was already half empty. There was a second glass on the bedside table, which looked clean from where I was sitting. I assumed that Alice hadn't been given a drop of wine to drink. The mountain man drank half a bottle in 30 minutes. The guy I'd gotten the relaxant from told me it was usually administered intravenously, and it took less than 60 seconds to take effect, but it can also be administered orally. When administered orally, it takes 20 minutes to take effect, it's faster if alcohol has been consumed. It had been a little over half an hour since Alice brought the wine, and apparently, he hadn't stopped drinking since then. He was damn sure he'd had enough to make the medicine work. For a few seconds, I wondered if he might have overdosed. Then I shrugged it off. At this rate, I might have a problem if I didn't try to kill him with my bare hands. I hoped I was right because I couldn't take any more of this abusing my wife. I pushed open the door and stepped into the room. The bastard's eyes got big, and he rose to his feet. He let go of her head, and she fell on her side, coughing and spitting up. The bastard had to be six feet five inches if he was an inch tall. He growled loudly and stepped forward to hit me. Unfortunately for him, he forgot his pants were around his ankles. He somersaulted forward and landed on his nose. It was nice to see that he didn't have time to pick himself up with his arms as he fell, they seemed to collapse under his weight as he landed. I looked down at him and grinned. Get up. Mommy's little fatty is afraid to stand up to a man. The guy's eyes got even bigger as blood rushed from his nose. I guess my behavior only surprised him because he was a foot taller and 150 pounds heavier than me, hell, maybe even more. 
Maybe he was over 200 pounds, he was huge. He started to struggle to get to his feet, and I told him that if he wanted to take his pants off, just let him go ahead and do it. I would let him. If he didn't want to, I'd take them off for him. He tried to pull his pants up, but they were so tangled they wouldn't budge. So, he did as I said, he pushed and pushed until they were at his feet, taking his shoes with them. It looked like real work for him, so the muscle relaxant must have been working. When he finally got to his feet, I put one of the brass knuckles on my right hand. Then I walked right up to him and jumped on his heels. I landed on the edge of his heel, and he shrieked, damn, that had to hurt. I piled all my weight on his shoulder, trying to lift him off the ground with my fist. I actually lifted him onto his toes, but the muscle relaxant helped the most. His abdominal muscles relaxed too, and my fist just slammed into his belly. It felt like my hand went deeper into his gut than my wrist. The air rushed out of him, and he flopped backward, landing on the bed. Wine spilled out of him, and without waiting for him, I stepped forward and started pounding his head with my fists, using my heavy, gloved hands. I aimed to land as many blows on his temples as possible. Alternatively, I went for his throat. My goal was to make him pass out without breaking my hands on his thick skull in the process. The was just pawing at me. He probably thought he was throwing punches, but he had no more strength than a kitten. I'm sure he had no idea why he couldn't hurt me. This had probably never happened to him before. After about 10 minutes, he gave up. He started crying, fell on the bed, and curled up in a ball, trying to cover his head with his hands. I turned to Alice, who was sitting on the floor, looking at me with her mouth open. See if her brains has any ties in his closet, girl. Bring them to me. She just stared at me for a minute before I barked, now. She jumped up and ran to the closet, grabbing a handful off the rack. She hurried back, and I grabbed the man's forearm. I yanked on it, flipping him onto his stomach, then wrapped the tie around it and tied it tightly. Jumping onto the bed, I pulled back his other arm and fastened the tie around it. I then tied his hands together behind his back. Dropping to the floor, I told him to get on the bed. He just looked at me over his shoulder. Reaching down, I pulled the sock off his foot and then clamped his nose. When he opened his mouth to take a breath, I stuffed the sock in it. Now you know what I mean, for brains, when I tell you to stick a sock up there. I laughed at him. The joke wasn't too funny, but that was the situation for me. My anger and hatred for this threatened to overwhelm me. I stopped for a moment and took a couple of deep breaths. I didn't care what happened to him, but my kids needed their father, and Alice would need me after I got her home. My family couldn't let me lose control of myself. Pinching his nose and clamping my hand over his mouth to keep the dirty sock in it, I asked him to lie down on the bed again. By now, he was sobbing real tears, choking, and unable to take a real breath. The inability to breathe had knocked the last vestiges of struggle out of him. He made his way to the middle of the bed, where I forced him to his knees, resting his head on the pillow. I then placed several pillows under his stomach before I began whipping his with a belt I had taken off his pants. It was a pleasant 10 minutes of beating before I got out of the nasty noose I was in. Every time I started to stop, I remembered Alice holding on to the chest where the son of a had hit her. When I stopped, his was bright red, already purple in places, and blood was oozing from other areas. Untying his hands, I pulled each one up to the post at the headboard of the bed and secured them there. After some adjusting, it wasn't apparent that his hands were bound, it seemed like he was holding on to the bed. As I stepped back and studied the bedroom, I saw a video camera on the dresser next to a digital camera. In one corner stood a computer. I asked Alice if he had been filming her. She hid her face in her palms and nodded affirmatively. I told her not to worry about it now, that we would discuss it later. Ideas began to form in my head. I told Alice to go to the kitchen, get dressed, and when she returned to the bedroom, to bring carrots, cucumbers, or any long vegetables with her. While she was gone, I booted up the computer and started looking for floppy disks and zip drives. 
There weren't many, but I started a complete formatting of every floppy disk I found and threw them in the trash once each one was completely reformatted. By the time Alice returned, I had formatted all the floppy disks. She looked much more comfortable in her clothes, and the look of hatred she directed at for brains was classic. She handed me a bundle of carrots, a couple of zucchinis, and two cucumbers. After asking Alice to start reformatting the five zip drives she found, I began an inventory of what I had in the bedroom. Now, I'm not a homosexual. As the saying goes, I have nothing against that lifestyle as long as they keep it away from me. If you like having fun with some guy, that's your business. I have something else entirely that lights my fire very hot. But what I saw at for Brain's house. He may have been a real homophobe. A lot of those big, rough men were like that. I always assumed they were disturbed because maybe they had done some experimentation in their youth and were afraid, deep down, that they were gay. Hell, I've read that almost every guy experimented with loving another guy when he was just learning how his own plumbing worked. No big deal. Girls are hard to find when a guy has just entered puberty. Judging by the way he treated my gentle wife, he was probably bragging very loudly about how much he hated those quirks. Given his size and temperament, I guessed he might be aggressive as well. I'd be surprised if he didn't pick fights with men he only suspected of being gay. I found a pair of scissors in the bureau drawer and used them to cut off her brain's shirt. He was now completely naked, and the sight was nauseating. It was truly an unappetizing sight. I wanted to save my wife, but now I felt real pity for her. It was out of the question that she would have willingly ended up with this slug. Calling Alice over, I handed her the video camera and told her she was now the family camera woman. She was to take as many clear shots of her brain's face as possible, ensuring that my face did not appear in any of the footage. With that, I stripped off my clothes. What I wanted to do, I might not have been able to accomplish, but I was determined to make him pay. For Brains was lying on the bed, his big sticking up. I took the biggest carrot I could find and shoved it up his. He howled and tried to get up, but the muscle relaxant had already taken full effect. He couldn't even pull his knees under him. I clamped his nostrils again and told him to shut up if he wanted to breathe. Taking the sock he had spit out earlier, I added another one from his other foot and stuffed them into his mouth again. After wiggling the carrot back and forth, I switched to a zucchini, slightly larger in size, which seemed to get his attention again. Meanwhile, Alice was videotaping the whole thing, capturing every humiliating moment. Every now and then, she would pause to take out one zip drive and insert another into the computer, continuing the process of reformatting. She had just finished setting up a close-up when she informed me that all the zip drives had been reformatted. One particular close-up was worth describing, it was Alice's idea. She turned for Brain's face sideways, making sure his mouth was covered to hide the socks, and got a great shot of his tear-streaked face. For Brain's was sobbing like a baby by the time the video shoot was over. I asked Alice if she wanted to play with the cucumber while I finished working on the computer. She jumped at the idea. While she had her fun, I proceeded to completely wipe the hard drive. When I left, the computer would still boot up, but nothing beyond that. Once the formatting was complete, I started a loop on the machine to endlessly copy the number 8 to the hard drive, ensuring that nothing could be recovered. Taking the carrot I had initially used, I knelt down next to for Brain's face and pulled the socks out of his mouth. Before he could say anything, I shoved a couple of inches of the carrot into his mouth and told him to start eating. He seemed reluctant until I reminded him that breathing was much more comfortable than not breathing. Reluctantly, he began to chew. His face contorted in disgust, but he chewed until he finished both the carrot and zucchini. By the time he was done, you couldn't tell from his face how much he loathed the experience. Leaving Alice to keep an eye on him, I searched the house for anything that could embarrass Alice. The only thing I found was a notebook, which I pocketed. Since I wanted to do a thorough search, the house was turned upside down before I was done. I easily checked around for anything still left to sort out. Handing Alice the videotape, I sent her home with explicit instructions to drive carefully. I made sure she knew I still loved her. 
After disabling the only phone in the place, I broke for Brain's car keys into two pieces, then gathered all of his clothes that I could find. I tied his ankles and wet the knots with water to make sure they would tighten. I untied his hands and left him on the bed. Before leaving, I did a few other sneaky things, like unplugging the water heater, leaving the kitchen sink with hot water only, and removing the float from the toilet tank. Just little things I'm not proud of now, but at the time, I took a strange satisfaction in doing them. Finally, I leaned over him and said, I know about the videotape, and if you ever bother Alice or me again, I'll make sure everyone knows who you are. You'll lose everything. With that, I took all the formatted zip drives and floppy disks and left. On the way home, I stopped by the Salvation Army drop-off point and left a roll of for Brain's clothing. Oh, yes, you might want to know about the address book I found. It was quite the piece of work. It didn't have many names, but a few were quite interesting. There were seven names listed under the letter C, with Alice's name appearing second to last. All of the names were female, and none started with an S. Each of the names had a little symbol next to them. The next morning, at 9.30 a.m., I called the first name on the list. A very timid female voice answered the phone. I introduced myself and asked if she knew for brains by name. The poor woman suppressed a sob and replied softly, yes. Trying to reassure her, I asked if she would like to make sure she never heard from him again. She asked what she should do. I told her she didn't have to do anything, just tell him that she had a videotape she would make public if he ever bothered her again. She should refuse any demands and, if she wanted, I would be happy to meet her at a restaurant of her choice to explain further. In a trembling voice, she named a Denny's restaurant located near my house. I made an appointment to meet her that evening. I met with her and, over the next few days, met with all but one of the other women on the list. One phone had been disconnected, but in each case, I told the woman about her brains and how they were free to refuse any further contact with him. I told them to say that the veggie chef had warned them not to let him contact them again, otherwise, the demo video would go public and be sent to everyone in his address book. When I told each woman they were free from his harassment, every one of them cried. All of them were attractive, wore wedding rings, and looked like soccer moms. I didn't allow them to tell me how they had fallen into his clutches, but I gave each permission to talk to the others if they wanted to. Including Alice, each woman gave me permission to share their contact information with the other victims, and Alice even talked to several of them. She told me they would be holding a meeting at our house in two weeks. Alice plans to send the kids to their grandparents for that night, but she asked me to stay home. I'm instructed to stay in my room unless she comes to get me. She thinks some of the women will want to meet me, but if any of them don't, I'll have to make sure I've got a good book in my den. Alice tells me it could be a long night, something about forming a support group to help each other. Oh, you probably want to know what Alice did to get herself into this mess. I'll be damned if I know. I love that woman, and I know she loves me. I'm not going to question her. She started to tell me when I got home, but I wouldn't let her. However she got into this situation, there was probably a rational, normal explanation for it. I suppose she might insist on telling me sometime in the future, but I don't care at all what it was. And you know what? I'm willing to bet everything I have that she'll never get into a mess like that again. In a way, I really am making that bet. Like I said, I never bet except on the right things.